<laughs> Don't believe me. Just watch. All right. Uh, it's Monday, September 18th. Will Menneker here, joined by Matt and Felix. We've, uh, we're back. Chapo's back for you guys. He's got a full slate of things to discuss today. But I suppose I will begin today uh, by saying I, I, have, I have but one thing. Actually, no. I have three things to say. And they are as follows. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. It's showtime. The musical. Looks like we're not invisible anymore. <laughs> Our girl, Lauren Boebert. Lauren Boebert back again, you know, in the, the in like exercising in the, in the flower of her youth. We all remember Lauren Boebert. Her, her tainted sliders from her shooter's bar and grill uh, made dozens uh, explode with uh, bloody diarrhea. Well, folks, it seems looks like Lauren is seeking to elicit a different bodily reaction, this time from her date during Beetlejuice the musical. Uh, I don't know where to begin with this, so I'll just say you can vape in Beetlejuice the musical. I'm sorry. This is not the London Philharmonic. This is not the Met Opera. You should be allowed to vape indoors during the yeah. performance of Beetlejuice the musical. And you should also be able to give your date a dry hand, Jay. We have gotten so many. We've heard it, like a million bullshit excuses for why we can't vape in a theater. And sometimes it's like, oh, this theater is 300 years old. Like yep. Hamilton performed the first version of Hamilton here 300 <laughs> years ago. You can't vape here. It will uh, blow up the theater or like. Oh, we have we have uh, smoke alarms and, you know, fire alarms, uh, which literally my vape is never set off. That only works in Iowa. Well, Will's did. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, that the, Iowa, like they don't know what they're doing over there. But like we, we've heard some pretty ridiculous ones. We were told like, that we would be exited from the stage in Canada for vaping. Yeah. On stage. Yeah. The, yeah. This fucking and we're uh, the performers. This like bullshit place in uh, Florida, they're like, you can't vape here. And it's like, you live in a swamp. <laughs> yeah, was... Like, how is it like worse than the air you breathe here? But I mean, you really, okay, a modern production of Beetlejuice in Colorado, really, you can't vape there. And it's like, if you don't let her vape, she's going to have to do something. She's going to have to give a crooked hand beezy. <laughs> to her to her lib date yes so it's the like if you don't want date, one you have to allow the other the, her lib date fact, who yeah. owns a bar that does fucking drag it's too shows good. it's too wow. good i mean like mm, sorry this is this delicious. is from the uh, uh i think uh, this is a uh, jesuit bell's coverage of this it says uh it says here additional security footage shows Ber bobert's previously unidentified date groper as she appears to touch his crotch at a performance of beetlejuice shortly before they were ejected and we've now learned who that lucky man is quinn gallagher the co-owner of hooch craft cocktail bar in aspen you know what i think something lost in the the la Faire bobert is Colorado is really underrated as one of the stupidest states in America. It, it, it was like, it was a magnet for in the 19th century, like magnet for all, you know, like the, 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 the common clay of the new West, you know, moron types. And now it's just got this sedimentary layer of like idiotic ski skiing people and, and Californians fleeing the taxes. It's, it's a idiot lasagna. Well, I mean, like, look, people, people like, you know, as it, as, it, as the article goes on here, the the, the co-owner of Hooch Craft Cocktail Bar. But it says, according to the New York Post, Gallagher, Gallagher is a registered Democrat and Hooch Craft Cocktail Bar is a gay friendly bar that hosted a winter wonderland burlesque and drag show back in January per an, inv per an invitation advertising the event on social media. Now, people will, you know, certainly comment on the juxtaposition of you know ardent culture warrior and anti-gay anti-drag anti-trans uh, demagogue lauren bobert dating a registered democrat who runs a bar that hosts uh, drag drag themed events at it but like i think they're overlooking the much more important piece of commonality between these two individuals is that they're both bar and grill owners and i think it's true in, they're in, small at least businesses. in colorado that supersedes you know these petty culture war disputes yeah yeah, yeah. They're part of the same class which what is that? Oh, it matters more. What a shock. I can't believe it. If I was Lauren Bobert and um, the doofus that she's with, I would start hiring protection because Colorado like you, you are right. Colorado is it's like a sanctuary for modern day hoople heads, you might say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a stupid state. It's a really stupid state. But Colorado's governor is he posts on r slash neoliberal. He's like um, a von Mises Institute Democrat. 
um, right. Jared Paulus. Jared he's Paulus, really trying uh, to. Yeah, he's really trying to make Colorado the like um, Matt Iglesias Yimby State. He's trying well, to he's give it a- like a, a a good image. And if like people re- realize and remember Lauren Boebert, she's given Crooked Hand Beezies up and down the Colorado <laughs> River. They're gonna be like, <clears throat> wait a minute, I don't care if this state like voted for you by like twenty points. I don't care if this is essentially like a bluer state than New York in the last. Uh, in the in the last election cycle, this is a state for idiots. I'm yeah. not gonna I'm not gonna build a super condo development. <laughs> no, here. We're not saying yes to anything in our backyard. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like because Polis is the like end stage liberal who's fully only a Democrat for s- cultural issues. Like that's it. Otherwise, like complete uh, libertarian uh, economic identity. And the premise of that is conservative social views are stupid they're dumb they're for hillbillies they're for knuckle draggers and if the rest of the citizens of colorado can't rise above that standard he's going to be gone he's going to leave you people yeah well i i I hated of course lauren bobert had to sort of humble herself and go on onn and say i was a little too eccentric i'm on the edge on a lot of things folks the only one on edge was her date after not being ha. completed. I, I love that she, I love that her defense of this is like that she's a manic pixie dream girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like her, yeah. Your, yeah. Kids are, your kids are in college. <laughs> yeah, she's a grandmother. Her kid has a yeah. kid. <laughs> uh, and she uh, also, the fact that she lied about the vaping before they found, oh yeah, there's a fucking, of course there's a fucking, do you not think there are cameras everywhere in public, you fucking moron? You're going to be able to say, oh no, I wasn't vaping. There's a fucking camera everywhere, idiot. And then she has to go like, um, I va- it's sort of the Reagan thing with Iran Contra. Like I said, I, I still believe I didn't vape, but the evidence tells me that's not true. Like Hassan Minaj, he was communicating emotional truths. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. that motherfucker. <laughs> Jesus he's, Christ. He's I love, insane. I'm sorry. Oh, I could joke because it's in service of a punchline. Oh, really? You have those? That would be, an, I'd love to hear one. He, like you people, he, people like you killed comedy by saying if this, it can't be uh, funny isn't enough. It has to be politically meaningful. Well, that means you've lost that standard. You can't say, oh, it's at least funny because it's not fucking funny. Yeah, there were people who were comparing it to like Richard Pryor mm. or like Dave Ch- with a Dave Chappelle joke where the baby is selling a weed out of a yeah. limo. And it's like, th- those are jokes. Yeah. Those are things that people applaud at the end of. Yeah. This is stuff to make him look op- oppressed. Yeah. And also like what like one of the things that he lied about was that it's rooted in a girl rejecting him yes, in high yes. school. Yeah, That's yeah. insane. That's yeah. fucking insane. <laughs> he said that he invented this whole thing. Okay. In reality, Hassan Minaj asked out this girl he was friends with. He asked, he asked uh, for her to go to homecoming with him or some shit. And she said, no, you know, I like you as a friend, but blah, blah, blah. And like 25 years later, he crafts this whole story where her family could spot. It's like Romeo and Juliet with a racial yeah. twinge where they're like, we actually, we're not letting our daughter date a Muslim. <laughs> and it was this whole dramatic thing. And it just did not happen. None of it happened. And the first few times he did it, he like put her name, <laughs> like he used her real name and picture. He's insane. He's insane. I it just, like, what is- it seems turns once again, politics is just sex. That's all it is. Your sides are picked by the way your dick is bent. And then everything follows that for per- it's a perversion. Public. Perversion. I don't, I don't like presumably he's had sex like since high school, at least <laughs> once. Yeah. He's got kids. I just like, how, well, right. he, had to, he, had to, he had to have sex to produce the daughter that had uh, anthrax splashed on her. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I, I mean, we'll get to that, but it's like, how do you hold on to like one rejection from high school? You have like, like half the population of this live. fucking country you're talking to. Like how I many know, people's politics is entirely good. based on some sexual, probably trauma in high school that they've never gotten <laughs> past. And you but know that, what? Like, that, that, that's and, and, not, and, and, it's not like the entire school like saw his dick and was like, Oh, Hassan, you have a stupid, you have a small cock. It was one girl being like nicely rejecting him. Princess and the P. The, the 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 normaler the rest of your life is, the more unforgettably traumatic minor incidents are. I guess so. Yeah, but it's just like it's just like I don't know. 
I mean, A, he's not funny, but B, like, I don't know, like heavily embellishing or just outright making up these sort of like just so stories of, I don't know, American racism and, and, and oppression of, you know, like of, of him and like, you know, oh, a, a girl friend zoned me. And, and, you know, I guess like, yeah, there's a, the explanation for that is, yeah, well, her family didn't want her dating a Muslim. And it's just like all part of this tapestry of being like, oh, like I'm, 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 I'm crafting humor out of like the horrible uh, racism that you know non-white people face in this country, and it's just sort of like, I, like a not funny to begin with, and b it's just sort of like it, it's bringing your own daughter into it, bringing real people from <laughs> you went to high school with. I like, mean, it's he he is right that hey, I'm trying to get an effect. It's just that traditionally that effect that was being pursued by a comedian is laughs, but his effect is different. His effect is to craft like a vision of himself for the audience. Like I am the type of person who suffers these sort of oppressions in my life and yet still carries on. And that's it. It's just a, it's self promotion. It's not self promotion to, Hey everybody, here's some funny jokes that'll make you like me because I'm funny. He didn't have that talent. So instead you will like me because you feel bad for me, I guess. As a probably white liberal who's very, feels very guilty about the country that they live in. And they're going to be like, oh, my God, that went you went through that. You're great. I'm going to watch your boring, unfunny Netflix show now. You know, like I, him, him being exposed is kind of a fraud. I'll say this. Uh, you know, someone else made this point. But boy, oh, boy, is he breathing easy after the Russell Brand news hit this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. taking a taking a big load off. It was like, oh, shoo, dodge that New Yorker profile. No one gives a shit about that anymore. Yeah. Russell Brand, really, he dove in front of him. <laughs> Yeah, the Russell Brand thing's been funny because it's a, a bunch of people who are like, "Come on, could you um, before this article, could you imagine this guy raping anyone?" <laughs> <laughs> this is clearly a hit piece. Yeah. Well, that's that's see, that's the thing is that the the this idea that he is being targeted because he's too dangerous to the regime, uh, that just it's like I kind of get where the basis of that comes from because you know these kind of stories are organized you know like somebody right, at, a, right. at a newspaper or a magazine it's like this guy i'm gonna look into him and you're thinking you're or you can argue if you're a certain frame of mind oh yeah the, the she they got a deep state call you got to take out brand he's saying too much confusing gibberish to people it's gonna make them do something <laughs> the star um, of get him to the greek has too much of a purchase right. on the youth of the west but there's another thing there's another possibility that just by being who he is he's very annoying and people decide, you know what, uh, maybe this, hey, maybe all the stories I heard about this incredibly annoying person that like have permeated uh, England for like 20 years, maybe I could check into some of those and say, oh, wow, look at that. The incredibly annoying person has some skeletons in their closet. Yeah. Though, I, they went after him, but not because he's going to bring down the regime because he's fucking irritating. Right. It's like kind of half true in this way, right? Where it's yeah. like these stories were out there before, but like no one there was no impetus to do this because like you know you could say oh he was like useful to yeah. paramount or universal or whatever like he was in right yeah and now that he's not in anymore now that he um does the lowest form of entertainment which is making youtube videos arguing about medicine mm -hmm. just i don't know how anyone watches that Look, if the if the vaccines like make your dick fall off, I still wouldn't watch that stuff. It's so <laughs> boring. I don't I mean, want to yeah. see anyone go like, oh, but there's a Quando Rondo five in it. I don't <laughs> give a shit. Shut the fuck up. But, um, you know, yeah, it, it's easier to do this story when he's not in movies anymore. Yeah. That aspect's certainly true, but. It's just like, OK, do you think that they they were lying when they planted the seeds of this story 20 years ago mm -hmm. when yeah. like Danny Minogue was like, this guy's a fucking creep in 2006? Like, no, this is this has been like an open secret for an incredibly long time. But it still takes like a, a particular uh, impetus to to bring it into focus. And that's the thing, that process that is an inevitable part, inevitable part of any journalistic conveyor belt. That is completely compromised. Like there is no collective faith in that process anymore. Right. So there is no uh, collective assimilation of any story anymore because your pre-existing relationship to the subject of the story determines your uh, your analysis of the process that you found out about it. Right. Like that's, and, and you're done. Yeah. 
Yeah, and as such, like, all the people are like, oh, thank God, I'm not going to have to see him anymore. Like, right. unfortunately, you're mistaken, because if he was still in movies, yes, that might be the case. But if your audience is there to watch you argue about medicine, yeah, it does not matter what they say you did in an article. Yep. You're still going to see him. He's still going to be making those videos about that damn medicine. Yep. And, you know, the you can you can walk around in your head thinking that. Russell Brand is now talking about medicine and not starring in movies because he cares so much about the medicine. He cares just so <laughs> darn much about America <laughs> and uh, the UK and the future. Uh, and that if he was still able to make movies, that he would not not give a fucking shit about medicine and he would be making movies. They actually think that he walked away from the films, walked away from actual stardom to, to tell the truth. Not, well, I can't be in movies anymore, but people will still watch me just ramble. And uh, actually, you know what? Uh, I'm a principled truth teller against the evil medicines, which is more likely, which fits your understanding of human nature better. Are you going to believe in fairies now? Uh, well, to um, uh, segue slightly back to our original topic. All right, Bobert. I didn't yeah, want to get away from Bobert. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, because no, we're talking sex. We were, we were talking sex crimes, but let's go talk about like sex good times right now. Yeah, because right, right, Bobert, right. everyone, everyone, all, we, ourselves included on this show, we're always always complaining about how every single politician in charge of this country is like a million fucking years old, and like they're just gonna die with their you know uh, skeleton like hand on the levers of power, and then. Here comes Bobert coming along, doing something cool and young that, that you know, regular people can relate to, which is, you know, she was like squeezing clearly, a titty in Beetlejuice. She was very, like, ready to go. Like, that dude, he was not finessing the game. If you watch that oh, video. Oh, no. Oh, he, he's, oh, he's grabbing it like a on. chest. It's like yeah. he's got oven mitts on. He's just, <laughs> yeah. no, he was, there was no, no cupping. There was no, 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 no subtle flash of the nipple. Like, it's, like it his was head just, yeah. full of lidocaine. He just flops this thing <laughs> onto her arm and just throw this back and forth and she just immediately goes for his dick he batted at those tits like a manure <laughs> he looked like a palace cat he was like give me those things and then, and then, yeah so yeah and then uh now, now she's got to apologize for it but you know i mean <laughs> I, andrew hudson already made this point but Joking aside, it is funny that she is in like uh, uh, the anti drag queen person when it's just like, lady, you're fucking and songing in public at a children's <laughs> musical. Beetlejuice the musical is not for adults. It's not, yeah. It's <laughs> drag themed bars are events for adults. You are at a musical for children just going to town on, on your, a guy's dick. A guy who has drag shows at his bar. Oh my God. Well, maybe she's trying to win him back for the heteros. <laughs> <laughs> she was on and, a secret mission. But I mean, we're really seeing here what happens when like the uh, the true believing uh, small bourgeois maniacs make it into power. Because remember that the the the, the uh, anti squad, the the ladies who entered Congress, the the QAnon contingent was Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, Boebert. Uh, and Marjorie Taylor Greene came in as like the more uh, fire breathing one of them. Yeah. Uh, who also is in a deep red district in northern Georgia that she has no chance of ever being removed from. And she came and immediately cut to leadership and became a little uh, little soldier of Kevin McCarthy. Uh, Bobert goes in there. Fuck you. She's one of those people who like made them vote 50 times to let the idiot become uh, Speaker of the House. She's still like at maximal conflict with leadership. But here she is jacking off a guy doing track team story time already after what? Uh, barely getting reelected. This is her first term. She's already just having a good time with a fellow member of her class no longer fired with the d desire to, you know, change anything. And she's going, you could just see her on her path to a uh, total assimilation into it because yeah, she divorced or lose her husband. And now she's uh, out on the town and there's going to be so many pleasures dangled before her. You really think she's going to still want to put her finger on the button? No, she's going to want to jack a guy off at fucking, uh, at Aladdin. <laughs> Yeah, Matt, you mentioned her loser husband, though. Uh, she she did say that um, she said she called criticism of her behavior at the show difficult and humbling and said, well, none of my actions or words as a private citizen that night were intended to be malicious or meant to cause harm. The reality is they did. And I regret that. She also cited her public and difficult divorce and said her behavior simply fell short of her values. You will remember, of course, uh, the man that she's getting divorced from was the guy who exposed himself to yep. um, teenagers at a bowling alley. And yep. then she defended him for that, yep. too. Beautiful. Welcome to the club, Lauren. But, uh, Matt, you made a point recently about how, 
like Bobert and Marjorie Taylor Greene coming in in the anti squad class. Marjorie Taylor Greene becoming a lickspittle of you know the uh, McCarthy and you know the the establishment Republican Party, um, and then Bobert doing the opposite, but barely barely winning re-election. And here's the thing. Marjorie Taylor Greene is something and funking like CrossFit instructors and, you know, yoga. To see, you know, she's, she's stepping Zang out all the time. She is, she, she is hot to trot. Yeah. She's a goer. But the thing is, she's getting away with it because she's ugly. Yep. And Lauren Boebert mm. is, by the standards of politics, pretty damn, she's, she's a firecracker. By the, by the <laughs> standards of Congress. Yeah, you got to remember, we're dealing on a wildly uh, <laughs> perverted curve here. Yes. Like, uh, and, Dianne Feinstein is, like, right in the middle of the bell curve here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mitch, 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 one of the Mitch, hotter members of Congress. Mitch McConnell is, like, BMOC, big man on campus. <laughs> um, Felix, uh, I was thinking about you because, I, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I myself am taking part in it right now. One of my favorite, anytime sort of like a, a like a, a Palin figure and her hijinks makes the national news, we get a very good display of horny libs. Yes. Themselves and just being like, I'll give her some of my Beetlejuice if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to give her a hanging Chad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the horned up libs, the horned up libs, myself included, are, are loving this one. I love those guys. I was yeah. so happy to see that Brian rediscovered that image. Um, did you see the, did you see, um, Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin blocked me for this recently. Really? I, um, what is Sarah up to these days? Well, I'll tell she you. She just got divorced. She just got she divorced. Made, she, she made, she's a, doing her semester abroad. Yeah. She <laughs> made a video where it's like her and one of her imbecile daughters, they're going to an exhibit that's like Van Gogh for children, basically. <laughs> It's like it, it's like a huge like uh, playroom style thing where you can walk around a room that's yeah I've look heard of like that. the yeah. dream, and it's she used like Windows Movie Maker or something and composed it in such a weird style that I said it was like you know it's the feeling of taking too much Nyquil, it's like dreaming. It, it's like yeah. when you take that fifth Benadryl right before you start seeing spiders, and you, it, she is doing semester abroad with her daughter. Which, like, I have to say, as I predicted, if you have a kid young enough, like Sarah Palin did, you know, she had a kid when she was like 20. Eventually, that kid's going to get older than you. <laughs> Sarah Palin's yeah. like 49 now. Her daughter's 52. It's just going to happen. <laughs> it's just they're going to surpass you. They're going to get older than you if you're young enough. Yeah. I will say, though, uh, I, got, I got a few other stories here. Lauren Boebert is is really not the only one. There's been a lot of news out of Congress this week of our elected representatives or aspiring elected representatives either slutting it up or slobbing it up. And I suppose we can start with uh, John Fetterman changing the Senate dress code so he can dress like um, the guy from Smash Mouth did, R.I.P. Yeah. Do we have do we have audio of Ron condemning this, by the way? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. That, no, but I, we like, need that. We I know need it's going to endear me to the hooting masses who love yeah. Donald Trump more than life. It's uh, turning into the evil principal from a rock and roll high school sequel. Yeah. Governor DeSantis, um, 75 percent of the voters you have to win wear T-shirts that are so big that they're basically caftans. How do you respond? <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to hear some of that audio? Yeah, it's really good. I promise you. Yes. Governor, very nice suit you're wearing today, but some may say you're a little overdressed to go to Capitol Hill. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Great so start. I, did you guys hear the U.S. Senate just eliminated its dress code because you got this guy from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. who's got a lot of problems? I mean, let's just be honest. Like, how he got elected, well, I, I mean, he got elected because they didn't want the alternative, but... um. He wears like sweatshirts and hoodies and shorts, and that's his thing. So he would campaign in that, which is your prerogative, right? I mean, if that's what you want to do. But to show up in the United States Senate with that and not have the decency to put on proper attire, I think it's disrespectful to the body. And I think the fact that the Senate changed the rules to accommodate that, um, you know, I think looks, speaks very poorly uh, to how they consider that. Look. We need this country. We need to be lifting up our standards in this country, <laughs> oh, not God. dumbing down our standards in this country. And this is an example why. Oh, perfect. All right, no, the, the people it's are going to. 
people are going I, to rally to the banner for this story. Yeah, this yeah, no, no. If there's one thing the American voters really care about in 2023, it's uh, showing the proper respect for the United States Senate. But this does <laughs> show, like Fetterman. I'm sorry, like if you are a electoral reformist who is seeking like some uh, some sort of dialectical synthesis who can like actually carry forward what you imagine could be a progressive version of the Democratic Party, and you know, good luck if that's what you believe. Fetterman is like your fucking Quidzak Haderach here because he is the only one who, just by being who he is, actually breaks through the cultural polarities that like keep you uh, in like a shrinking percentage of like working class voters. Like just by being a slob. Like if you look at his margins in Pennsylvania and they were nailing him for that during uh, the, 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 the primary too. And they were nailing him for literally having a stroke. And he won, he won, he won at so many like Trump counties. And, that, and then he shows up at the, and the Senate and the Republicans who should by this point know where their cultural bread is buttered, that they are, if they have a future, it is at the no co- as the no college party at the not wearing a suit party. They just can't resist and they go after the only thing they can see about them. And it just, it shatters and destroys their programming that allows them to just effortlessly array things in the right, uh, culture war sides. And, He's the guy. Too bad his brain apparently is uh, is not working too good because otherwise he would be the guy. I mean, yeah, I mean, better, better, better the the XXL shorts and 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 slide, uh, you know, slide ons than you know a hospital gown. But yeah. I mean, I I could care I could care less if his brain works. Like if he votes right, you know, I could put my hands over his eyes and he could think I could disappear. I don't care, you know, whatever. Uh, the real thing for me that prevents me from getting excited about any future prospects is um, he just like, I mean, it's a calculation I get, but nonetheless hate. But he immediately folded on Israel. You know, he immediately. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, he immediately, you know, is clear. I want to. He knows. I want I want a smooth ride to the Senate. Yeah. He you know, knows where there, the there are. Water. There are jobs in which, like, even myself, like, I, I feel a certain level of, like, again, totally symbolic reassurance by having the people doing the job wear a suit. Like, for instance, pilot on an airplane. Like, I know, even though I know he's an okay pilot, like, if, if my if the airline pilot was dressed like John Fetterman, I'd be like, mm, I don't know how, how good I feel about that. Again, totally irrational, totally symbolic thinking, but, like, I'm just, I'm admitting that on my part. U.S. Senator is not one of them. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. They should, I'm you, sorry. They should, U.S. senators should have to wear the sports jerseys of the states they represent. Yes, That's the only yeah. thing that they're allowed to wear in, in the yep. Senate. The place where Jim Imhoff wandered in with a fucking snowball and waved it around to prove the global warming wasn't real. We, we, they're lying by putting these apes in suits. So that's that's Fetterman uh, slobbing it up. But I just have uh, two more examples here. Uh, politicians slutting it up. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Governor Christy Noem having supposedly, allegedly, years long affair with Corey Lewandowski. That is, I, I'm pretty surprised by that one. I mean, like, I knew that Corey had gotten with Hope Hicks. Uh, that's old news. I'm not it mad about really, it, don't worry. I'm not. Well, it just, it makes sense because he was, he was sort of like the alpha male in that campaign. And that was like her only option. It's whatever, you know. Uh, when I'm, when I, when I, when I get with her, I'm, I don't care who she's been with, but I don't care. I don't care I, about body counts. Yeah, I don't and actually Corey Lewandowski does. Cause he's got one. He's got two. And I'm, I'm not yeah. talking, se- talking yeah. sex, but I am impressed that he fucked a governor. Yeah. That's pretty impressive to me. His, uh, murderous Pollock charm worked on a governor. Granted, so, of one of the Dakotas. Yeah. But it's still, still a like governor. a half junior, junior league, half governor, governor there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's still, you know, she gets invited to. Events. She was on the short list for VPs for Trump. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, then, and then finally, we've got um, House candidate uh, from Virginia, Susanna Gibson, a Democrat, was uh, doing sex on Chatterbait with her husband for tips, which apparently violates Chatterbait's rules. But I got to say, uh, Susanna Gibson, even hotter than Lauren Boebert. Whoa, we got to get her into Congress. We need to make this happen quick. You're listening to Chapo Misogyny Hour. We have the attractiveness <laughs> of various women and their sexual affairs. This, no, uh, this story is kind of charming to me because like, OK, Chatterbait. Yeah, I, is that yeah. still a thing? I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's very quaint. It was, she was sending her butthole on Friendster. <laughs> yeah, it's very <laughs> yeah. it's like it's like cute. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, I just love in the uh, the Washington Post uh, coverage of this story. It says here, um, Susanna Gibson, a nurse practitioner. Hello, nurse. And mother of two young children running in a highly competitive suburban Richmond district, streamed sex acts on Chatterbait, a platform that says it takes its name from the act of masturbating while chatting online. Look, I actually I, I give her a lot of credit for this because she's saying that she's not dropping out of the race and that like, you know, like the this, you know, attack on her, you know, sexuality or personal autonomy or whatever. I mean, I, I just give her credit for not dropping out of the race over this. You know, I got to say, she though, was a nurse. Uh, she's trying to like, get a little side hustle, you know, doing doing sex on camp. I would really be interested in the Federal Election Commission ruling on whether you can show hole online for donations. <laughs> Well, at Post Citizens United, they better allow you to show a hole for money. I mean, it seems like it's implied very heavily by Citizens United. So she should raise funds that way. Absolutely. Uh, Moving on uh, from the the hijinks of Congress, let's talk about the hijinks of the Air Force who uh, have lost an F-35. Straight up lost an F-35. And this is from the Wall Street Journal. An advanced Marine Corps F-35B jet fighter. Oh, wow. This is like the, you know, next, even more next gen here. Jet fighter went missing Sunday after a mishap forced a pilot to eject near Charleston, South Carolina. The pilot ejected safely and was being treated at a local medical center, but the plane couldn't be found as of Sunday evening, a spokesman from Joint Base Charleston said. Uh, This is the, uh, I know, I know Chris loved this story and he loved this, this part of the story. Uh, if you have any information that may help our recovery teams locate the F-35, please call the Base Defense Operations Center, the Post said. They're putting out a 1-800 number for just the Charleston, South Carolina area. They're like, hey, have you seen this missing F-35? If so, call this number. Now, friends, listeners, if you are a Chapo head in the Charleston or just South Carolina area, we would like to engage your services in the most epic treasure hunt of all times. This is like Mr. Beast here. Find that F-35 and sell it to us so we can sell it to the Chinese. This is your, this is your Mr. Beast style challenge. $3 trillion jet shrugging. No, we should absolutely not give it to the Saudis. Or I'm sorry, we shouldn't give it to China. We like China. We should give it to the Saudis. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> The best thing about giving the best thing about giving an exploding plane to the Saudis is you're not like you're not giving it to like a poor conscript who didn't want to be there. Yeah. All the Gulf, uh, the Gulf monarchies, the modern version of the cavalry, the spot for the nobility is flying uh, hybrid fighter uh, air to ground uh, multi-role jets, Mm -hmm. things like the piece of shit F-35. You are guaranteed to kill a member of the royal family. Yep. By giving Head's going to fly them. right off. Although yes. apparently this guy ejected without being decapitated. So, <laughs> well, it's the proof. <laughs> yeah, Matt, keep in mind, this is the F-35B. Oh, um, yeah. it's, it, sorted, it sorted out a lot of the decapitation problems with the F-35A. They got, they got the kinks out. Doesn't cut yeah. your head off every other time but, you okay. eject anymore. Like some people have speculated that the plane could still be on autopilot and is still just sort of like cruising around out there or something. Or it cra- oh, man, it's kind insane. of hard to believe that like an F thirty five could crash in South Carolina and they're still like, yeah, you think it'd be, yeah. I don't got like any maybe tips into the this. Blue Ridge Mountains or something where nobody <laughs> I is. Know. I don't know. But uh, no, I like to think yeah, it's still out there, just still cruising down the lane because he like dropped a hoagie onto a big button that said eject. <laughs> like I don't know. I need more explanation of how the guy ejected accidentally while just flying the thing. I need to know how that happened. Did the plane do it? Did the plane hijack itself? Are we at that Ooh, point? Are we in the AI. film stealth? <laughs> <laughs> Of last week and the and this weekend, which is uh, the, the Mitt Romney's sort of retirement victory lap, you know, like he he announced over the weekend that <laughs> wait, wait, wait which victories? I, no, no, no. What, what exactly, is the Romney no. uh, uh, trophy chest filled with? Well, I mean, What's th- this is my point. His victory is retiring now, and his victory is in his video where he announces that he will not seek re-election. He just says it's because I'm too old. And it's clearly like, you know, like a a, a pointed barb at both Biden and Trump. But I love the troll of Mitt Romney, who is the handsomest and healthiest 80 year old man on the planet. 
just saying, sorry, can't serve in office anymore. I'm simply too old and infirm. You know, yeah. he's stunting on him and, you know, good on him for that. But like what I, what I say, like his, his victory retirement lap is that like he now gets to like um, sort of bow out as a statesman and sort of have his version of events be yeah. sort of chiseled into the tablet of his career. You know what I mean? Yes. And, 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 and mainly uh, this takes a form of a McKay Coppins piece, um, and then, uh, which is an excerpt from a book coming out. It's titled What Mitt Romney Saw in the Senate. And, you know, like it, it's about his, his horror at like, you know, the, most of my party doesn't even believe in the Constitution anymore. And it's just a way to him to, like I said, like shank Biden and the Democrats who were so very mean to him when he ran for president. Mm, yes. And also like make a stance for kind of like, you know, the the sensible, you know, uh, constitutional style Republican as, uh, as opposed to like the, you know, the, the barking hordes of MAGA Republicans who view him as a traitor. Now, uh, I, I think I thought this was best summed up by uh, that guy, uh, you know, that guy Noah Blum. Yeah. A, yeah. Real Love shit. No, no Blumkin. The films that come out of there. <laughs> Wonderful. stuff. <laughs> as I said, He's, he writes here, uh, the way Romney was treated 100 percent set the stage for Republicans to want something like Trump. And y'all better come to terms with it. Felix, y'all once again, fuck off. Even, the, even the neoconservatives are getting soy now. It's yeah, just, soy is everywhere. Crazy. Soy yeah. is universal. It's like coral from uh, Armored Core 6. It <laughs> penetrates all. Uh, I have to say, like, if you're Mitt Romney and you want like, you know, you want it to be normal time again, your best hope would be like a Biden 2008 or better style blowout against Trump. That's really, that's the only thing you can be like, it has to be seven points or greater. It has mm-hmm. to, Biden has to win in 2024 by that much, or you're just, you're not going to get to be normal again. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Yeah, that's for sure. They need to, they need a, just a huge up, just a massive repudiation. And I don't know yeah. if uh, I don't know if old Joe's got it in him, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> let's just say a lot would need to happen. Yeah. Wouldn't it? But, you know, like by sort of creating for himself this kind of uh, self-authored moment of statesmanlike humility and, and bowing out with grace. Like I said, he his reward for that is he sort of gets to like write his own story about his career, which, you know, before before I dive into the uh, McKay Coppins piece um, in the Atlantic, I just want to say that, like, d- despite the way uh, like he sort of talked about mostly among Democrats now, Mitt Romney's career in the private sector was just it was a thousand times more destructive to like American lives than anything Donald Trump ever did with his chintzy real estate scams and like naming licensing rights and shit like that. It's a per- it, like that that dichotomy is just a perfect illustration of how of how these people are able to mystify themselves because Mitt Romney now has through this narrative convinced himself well you know this Trump stuff's bad but it's not because of my party or my worldview it's because the democrats were too unfair to me when i ran for president because i'm a good guy and i'm not like this guy but they treated me like a bad guy meanwhile he is actually responsible for trump but not because the democrats were mean to him but because he was one of the corporate pirates of a class of people who systematically dismantled the manufacturing economies of the midwestern states that trump won in 2026 2016 (laughs) yeah so he is literally responsible for it because he lives in the fantasy land of politics he gets to tell himself you know it did come down to me but it came down to democrats being so mean to me unlike everybody else in every other presidential election in history like what the fuck do you think running an an election is you are very mean to the other side. You try to scare people into voting against them. That's what's always been. Them Republicans don't do that. Yeah, you guys, yeah, yeah. They, they said that John Kerry gave himself a bump like a pro wrestler. <laughs> you know, like this is, yeah, yeah. and they were right. They were right to. It's they were politics. Right with the, little, the little purple hearts at the convention, you crying bitch. Yeah, it's politics, you know, grow yeah. up. But yeah, Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney was strip mining you know, medium sized companies three at a time for what we ask. It turns out to eat demonious X style meals of frozen salmon on hamburger buns while watching sub prestige TV alone. You That's have the real, he has like a billion yeah. dollars. What that the is fuck? the just bone chilling part about it is that he did this. He is one of the people whose blood's on his hands for the Republic that he thinks he loves. And this is the 30 pieces of silver he got. Yeah. Duke Cunningham had a boat. You he's know? Got, <laughs> the Duke. He's living like Marty yeah. Hart after the divorce. Yeah. If I <laughs> was Mitt Romney, dollars. 
if I was Mitt Romney and I'm doing like the Macbeth thing of like, look, I'm already going to hell. Like I already, I did all this shit. I, but I have like a billion dollars. I have this body unpoisoned by vaping or alcohol or anything. What am I doing with my billion dollars? Um, I'm getting two drifters to fight each other in my living room. I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, doing stuff like that. I'm playing the most dangerous game. I'm not watching Ted Lasso eating a misery salmon meal <laughs> yes. and scrolling, I, scrolling online oh like every other God. loser. You could do that on like sub minimum wage, man. You need to destroy the lives of millions of people so you can live the way that it, like a depressed middle manager does. It's really, it's really, really bad. I mean, all the other private equity guys, uh, like Henry Kravis from Barbarians at the Gate, they live in the coolest places ever. Are these guys bad? Yes, they're some of the worst Americans the last 50 years. But Henry Kravis lives in a three-story apartment with a swimming pool. In, not in the building, like in his unit. <laughs> in unit pretty, swimming pool, yeah. yeah well, pretty cool. <laughs> Pretty cool Listen, stuff. What you're talking about, I think, sort of gets to the heart of Mitt Romney, like as a national figure, and like the the way, for, like for the for whom, like for the people for whom he represents, this kind of like uh, the the road not taken for republic, like a sort of constitutional moderate Republican statesman to like you know shepherd our country. And the way that he was never and never really got over, despite the fact that on paper, every like he was a popular governor of a democratic state, you know, like. Obamacare was his health care plan. He got the Olympics to Salt Lake City, record of success in business, popular in both Utah and Massachusetts in his in his uh, holding political office. But here's the thing. We've talked about it before. And I, and I alluded to this in his trolling of Trump and Biden for being like, I'm too old. Like, if you had told me Mitt Romney is 80, I'd be like, you're lying. Get the fuck out of here. He right. Looks, if he looks 50 years old and like it's an advertisement, him and his gorgeous huge family it's an advertisement for the church of latter-day saints but here's the thing mm -hmm. we talked about it many times before on the show mormons and mitt romney himself is too american for america when mm -hmm. we when yes. we are, when we in, when we encounter someone who looks like the president in a movie and behaves like it or is just is more american than we are it it frightens who the fuck are you us. what's this we don't we don't relate Think to better him. than me yeah, we do yeah, not it's, relate it's to the that. Original, original reason why Homer hates Ned Flanders. <laughs> yes. Buenos dias, neighboritos. The handle's Flanders, but my friends call me Ned. Hi, Flanders. We, I mean, Biden polls bad, sure. He underperformed in his last election, but people are more, way more comfortable with the idea of Biden as president than ever anyone like Mitt Romney. You and, know, you know what, yeah, you can't imagine what's going on in his mind. The only actual like actual bigotry that prevented Mitt Romney from getting the getting becoming the Republican president of the United States is from evangelical Christians who regard <laughs> Mormons as a you know wildly heretical blasphemers. Like, I mean, I don't, which, I don't which, give a shit. Which, I don't give a shit one way yeah. or another. Which it is, but like, what do you yeah, think? But evangelical it's, that's not, that's not, that's, that's not sweat off my nose. No, yeah. it's the perfection of American Christianity. It is yeah. that shit from the evangelicals is just hater fuel. That is just oh, yeah. hater aid. You got blown. You got beat. Joseph Smith. He had a little bit of a step on you, and he perfected American Un Christianity. Undrafted, well, you undrafted. We're hooting on jugs and giving yourself strychnine poisoning. Joseph Smith went. Well, he went to. He was from a, a Big East conference school. No football there at all. Undrafted comes into the league of major American religions. Blows everyone out of the water. Evangelicals are fucking. They're broke. They want to mm -hmm. be ballers divorced multiple times. Yeah, they suck. What if we, we've said it a million times. Mormons are everything they pretend to be. Indeed. The, evangelicals have to do this like um, subterfuge where they draw Jesus in increasingly like whiter shades to make him look more and more American. Uh, Mormons are like, no, he was American. He was he American. Here. He came look at his here. passport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's called going for it. Yeah. They didn't give a fuck. And, and they, they paid. It's like, I'm sorry. You guys couldn't handle being Mormon. You could not stand up to the rigors of it. So go, just go to your mega church. Yeah. No. And no evangelical could handle the pressure of being a god on a planet. Oh, my God. Can you of imagine? Running, running their own planet. They can't even run Liberty University. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, just a little bit from the uh, Atlantic article. Because like, in, in addition to his mind of Jason fail meals, uh, there's some pretty... 
pretty good color about Mitt Romney, including this first paragraph. For most of his life, Mitt Romney has nursed a morbid fascination with his own death, suspecting that it might assert itself one day suddenly and violently. I mean, like, bro, you, you've won. Kind of You're in your is. 80s and could probably run a marathon tomorrow. Like, just forget about it, dude. Just take a load off. Like, it, it doesn't matter. But he says he controls what he can, of course. He wears his seatbelt and diligently applies sunscreen and stays away from secondhand smoke. For decades, he's followed his doctor's recipe for longevity with monastic dedication. The lean meats, the low-dose aspirin, the daily 30-minute sessions on the stationary bike, heartbeat at 140 or higher, it doesn't count. He would live to be 120 if he could. So much is going to happen, he says, when asked about this particular desire. I want to be around to see it. That's ominous. <laughs> but some part of him has always doubted that he'll get anywhere close. <laughs> yes. The great eye will open. <laughs> uh, but listen when to a this. guy like that says it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Project Arcturus will be culminating. <laughs> yeah. we're, fu- we're, fu- we're finally going to divide the, uh, the sectors of America. Into, di- into different corridors. We're going <laughs> to elect that. We're going to elect the flesh emperors. <laughs> I'm hearing that our red heifer research department is getting really close. <laughs> uh, but it, listen to this. He says he has never really interrogated the cause of this preoccupation, but premonitions of death seem to follow him. Once years ago, he boarded an airplane for a business trip to London and a flight attendant whom he'd never met saw him gasp and rushed from the cabin in horror. When she was asked, <laughs> listen to this, listen to this, Felix. When when she when she was asked what had so upset her, she confessed that she dreamt the night before about a man who looked like him, exactly like him, getting shot and killed at a rally in Hyde Park. He didn't know how to respond other than to laugh and put it out of his mind. But when a few days later he happened to find himself on the park's edge and saw a crowd forming, he made a point not to linger. Can you imagine how happy would he would have been if he had been in the Capitol on January 6th and oh my got, God. like, pulled apart like the captain in uh, Day of the Dead? <laughs> Choke on him! Choke on him! It would have been, like, uh, in the last season of The Shield when Shane Vendrell is, like, suicidal. Yeah. And he's, he's like, trying yes. to die as a hero all those times, all those great scenes. And then he just he gets to be he gets to be just shredded by by his fellow Republicans. Yeah, I, I do. OK, the ultimate martyr. I have some I do have a similar thing to this, honestly, mm. like a little bit. I oh, have I've been huge on hypochondriac, so I, I absolutely get him on that. Oh, I'm not a, I'm not a hypochondriac at all. I'm kind of like the opposite. I feel well, like no, I someone, mean, you either think you're going to die of a disease or something or you think something's going to kill you. One right. Another, you I, right. Right. On it. I think it's the other thing like disease. I feel like if someone could tell me I have cancer and I could just sleep it off, I'd be fine. But like I did have, I had like a dream, like a sleep paralysis thing more. So when I was a kid, that was like basically told me I was going to die on a Tuesday. And ever since then, I have just, I've been terrified <laughs> of flying on Tuesdays. I've been afraid of like really doing wow. anything. And like, I have, you know, again, not a hypochondriac. I don't, I don't think any, like I, I talked about this on Twitter, like Jewish people can withstand heart attacks, leukemia, uh, being 80 years old. None of that bothers me. That's not scary to me. I just, I think it would be like a freak thing. Like a crazy person shoots me in the head or something like that. That's more kind of like Mitt. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like for whatever reason, like it has, in reality, what actually is that? It's pretty, you know, it's the same thing that dreams always are. It's a jumble of the conscious and subconscious. And it doesn't, a lot of the times it doesn't actually mean anything. And this one assuredly does not But, you know, we assign special providence to these things. So I, I end up having the same thing as him. I will avoid, yeah, fly, being in an airplane on a Tuesday for that reason. I mean, that, that is, I mean, yeah, if, if I had, if I had a dream that I remembered that vividly of, of some being telling me that I was still going to die on a Tuesday. Yeah. I would not be, uh, yeah, 
I'll be not, I'm not going out uh, for Taco Tuesday. I'd be staying indoors on Tuesdays. This but, is um, probably tempting fate, but sometimes I do think like, well, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> so far, so happens. good. So far, yeah. so good. Now, um, Romney's premonition of death is used to set up an incident in which um, the main independent senator, Angus King, Angus King of his famous steakhouse, or delicious. rather not of his famous delicious steakhouse, which he should be running instead of whatever dumb bullshit he's up to. Um, basically, just about how Angus King relayed to him a message from uh, a general, I believe, one of the handsome generals, about all the chatter pre-January 6th that they were hearing on social media about people arming themselves to come to D.C. to kill Mitch McConnell. And then Romney gets Mitch on the phone and is like, Mitch, have you heard about this? Like, I'm very concerned. And then Mitch is just like, new phone, who this? And like, basically, he tells Mitch McConnell and he's like, yeah, let me get back to you on that. And then just doesn't do anything. And then there's another part where like Mitch is talking shit about Donald Trump. And then, of course, he claims never to have said it, anything of the sort. But that, that, that's not the interesting part of this article. The interesting part of the article is this. In the dining room, a 98-inch TV went up on, a, on the wall and a leather recliner landed in front of it. Romney, who didn't have many real friends in Washington, ate mm. dinner alone there most nights, watching mm. Ted Lasso or Better Call Saul as he mm. leafed through briefing materials. On the day of my first visit, he showed me his freezer, which was full of salmon fillets that had been given to him by Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska. He didn't especially like salmon, but found that if he put it on a hamburger bun and smothered it in ketchup, it made for a serviceable mm. meal. <laughs> Sa salmon with ketchup on a hamburger bun. Well, I mean, you know, you can't let it go to waste. Mr. Hot Dog. You personally meat. are responsible for probably hundreds of thousands of fentanyl deaths. And you're worried that you're going to waste Murkowski salmon? Just this is the definition of perversion. It does make me like Murkowski because it's like she knows no one wants to eat like that salmon. much salmon. Yeah. But she knows <laughs> yeah. that. And it's, it feels like a bullying thing. Like she does that to anyone she wants to fuck with. Like, hey, dumbass, here's 200 pounds of salmon. Enjoy trying to fit this in your apartment, fucko. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny yeah but yeah it actually surprises me for a guy how, as healthy as he is that he doesn't like salmon and that like you know hot dog meat famous well, hot dog favorite, meat is his, his favorite, his favorite meat. meats yeah salmon i gotta does. say there's a salmon's little bit of ass. It, it's not yeah, really news, it's just, good in certain contexts i think the salmon is delicious i don't know what you're talking about yeah. when you get it nice and the the, the pieces just kind of fall apart you, you make yeah, sure that there's like enough left Olive oil, some garlic, and lemon juice in there. Sounds like you should go to the Senate. You put maybe a uh, a yogurt based sauce. So like a like a teriyaki salmon, I think, or miso glazed salmon. Oh, no, it's delicious. And oh, if we're talking cedar planked and herb crusted, then get the <laughs> fuck out of here. This is a delicious these are not, meal. You people, are these freaks. are not planked salmons. This was this is frozen salmon that he's defrosting and putting ketchup on. He could do and, better than this uh, and enjoy. Watch it. It. He's a sicko. I'm sorry. He's a freak. But, this this calls this this calls to mind uh the, the, the you know like a a sense memory of the famous Frank Luntz profile with him oh, eating yes. spag bowl as watching good as the it gets for me. as this is as good as it gets for me and it's just him like no friends just the, the image of him eating a salmon ketchup burger watching Ted Lasso on a Ooh. 98 inch screen uh, while half hearted no, no wonder he's trying to get out of this on it of this what has the what fucking depressing Zana dude decreed a stately pleasure dome for fuck's sake <laughs> 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 what are you doing this is the worst ruling class that has ever existed JP Morgan drank yeah. so much that he had a cauliflower shaped growth coming out of his nose <laughs> yeah he was a, something to look at yeah he jp morgan got pussy he did all, all day every day yeah he had parties where he would eat like 85 oysters mm -hmm. there hasn't been this austere a member of the ruling class since john d rockefeller himself the original sicko it's true and that's why he's got to be there signing laws and why he tried to be the guy killing people with like drone strikes and, and invasions because he needs that because that's how much of a pervert he is yeah. because that is what draws politics perverts I gotta uh, say there's a little bit of news or at least not news more just reminding us of something we all should know that shit about him trying to warn Mitch about uh, January 6th in advance it really does remind you that like it was not some surprise that these who these fucking hoople heads are gonna storm the palace like they were all talking about it, and yeah. yet there were still like what, like a two rows of guys just kind of standing yeah. like assholes in yeah. front of the, uh, the the Capitol. Somebody made a decision at some point to let this shit occur. I don't yeah. know if there's any way you can argue against that because 
look at what happened when they inaugurated the motherfucker. They had the entire National Guard bayonets out on the fucking uh, lawn. They could have had that on January 6th, and these fucking pussies weren't going to do anything if that had happened. Yeah, I mean, like, Mitt Romney hears it and takes it, a, you know, a thousand percent literal. But, you know, Mitch McConnell, that's why he never got back. He's like, yeah, sure, they're going to kill me. Who cares? You know, like, he's like, oh, <laughs> I love that. Thank they're God. Gonna, God. I love that. They're, wow. they're going to kill me and my wife. Yeah, sure, I, can I, can, I can finally go to hell. I, I'm 500 years old at this point. I would love to die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually, you think I'm a human. I am a, a mutant descendant of those 500 year old fucking tortoises. And I'm yearning for death. It, in Elden Ring, one of the big things is they took out the rune of death. And there's no more. There's no, like you can't die anymore unless like a magic guy kills you. And you're just so you're just condemned to like eternal shitty life. And I feel like that's what happened to him. Yeah, that's why he has those spells. He's waiting. He's, he thinks he sees them he's, <laughs> like in the scrub. It's like, is that him? Is that the magic dude who's going to finally free me from this? And then, oh, shit, it's not him. <laughs> oh, uh, the, the last thing I want to read from the, uh, the McKay Coppins profile, though, is, is this. Shortly after moving into his Senate office, Romney had hung a large rectangular map on the wall. First printed in 1931 by Rand McNally, the Histo map attempted to chart the rise and fall of the world's most powerful civilizations through 4,000 years of human history. When Romney first acquired the map, he saw it as a curiosity. After January 6, he became obsessed with it. He showed me that he showed the map to visitors, brought it up in conversations and speeches. More than once, he found himself staring at it alone in his office at night. The Egyptian Empire had reigned some 900 years before it was overtaken by the Assyrians. Then the Persians, the Romans, the Mongolians, the Turks. Each civilization had its turn and eventually collapsed in on itself. Maybe the falls were inevitable. But what struck Romney the most about the map was how thoroughly it was dominated by tyrants of some kind. Pharaohs, emperors, kaisers, kings. A man gets some people around him and begins to oppress and dominate others. He said the first time he showed me the map, it's a testosterone related phenomenon, perhaps. I don't know. But in the history of the world, that's what happens. America's experiment in self-rule is fighting against human nature. This is a very fragile thing, he told me. Authoritarianism is like the gargoyle lurking over the cathedral, ready to pounce. For the first Shut time up. in his life, for the first time in his life, he wasn't sure if the cathedral would hold. I just love the idea of him being uh, up until January 6th. He was just like, uh, check out this histo map. It's a cool thing in my office. And then after it, he's like staring at it, like, you know, with a over a, a snifter of chocolate milk or something, just going, <laughs> all civilizations <laughs> must crumble. All great men must fall. Here, behold, Ozymandias. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's, he's reading some W. Cleon Skousen. Everyone's favorite Mormon uh, apocalyptic nutso who loved to talk in those giant historical terms. The West, you know has fall the West has fallen. Millions, billions must cry to Ted Lasso. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess the thing is like, first of all, like January 6th, that's your first indication that like the, 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 the gargoyle of authoritarianism stalks the battlements of American democracy. Okay, sure. And then like, and, and, and that's its first, you know, uh, you know, barrage across the across the bow is january 6th but you know again it's just like this is a guy who's been like a down the line republican his entire fucking career and now he's just like our civilization is about to crumble you know what'll stop it me resigning and setting an example for everyone and you know what though like i, I think it's weird like it, it, the mormon thing because you're thinking in terms of eternity you look at like ancient egypt ancient rome you know, the Persian Empire, it's like, oh, they all were around for like, a, like you know, nine centuries and then fell. That's a good run. Who cares? Like, we're fucking ahead of the curve as far as that goes. And it's just sort of like, I, I don't get also like existentially despairing about like the rise and fall of civilizations. It's just like, it's, well, it's what because we do. of the way we it's because of the way we remember history. We remember history in these periods like the, uh, this empire, then it fell, this empire, then it fell. And then the gaps between is just this empty space. But although there tends to be less archaeological evidence for those times, which is why we don't have as much of a, a thick historical narrative around them. People still obviously were living. We're living. People were obviously surviving. People were loving and, and, and all the stuff we're doing. They were doing yeah. all that stuff. They just weren't making as strong a record of it because there wasn't the density of, uh, of civilizational structures. But they weren't all gone. There were still this, this social uh, fabric that persisted. 
and we can't because that's since, since it looks like a black hole from the from the our position we just assume that that's all there is is these this fall into a chasm when in reality it's people adjusting to changing conditions and evolving new social structures to deal with those conditions it's the same thing that history always is it's not the end of anything it's the tra- continued transformation of one in more internal thing yeah well, i think like you know it's with the mormon thing it's like you need to america needs to be eternal because if america falls it's like the world ends yes yeah i but it also i mean like there's nothing i hate more than like the people who are the most comfortable of the most comfortable like yeah. uh i hate anyone who has the same job as me and is like, well, looks like we're all going to die from climate change or fucking whatever. And it's like, we, we, we don't even, we don't even have to answer the same emails as normal people. Do you think you're going to experience climate change in the same way that somebody from fucking Bangladesh will? But like, I just the constant obsession with the world ending by people who are uniquely insulated from, you know, whether they are apocalyptic or just bad things happening those types of events is incredibly frustrating but it also does make me think like okay the world has ended a billion times before yeah the world as people have known it has ended i'm sure for people living you know from 1916 to 1919 it felt like the world was ending and it was to an Mm -hmm. extent yeah they were witnessing horrors that are unparalleled uh, compared to anything that we in America, people who mostly listen to this show or, you know, have a computer job experience today. That's not to say that, like, everything is great, but truly, truly cataclysmic, like, era ending things have happened. And humanity doesn't just stop. There are well, those, yeah, as Matt said, periods that aren't as rigorously recorded, but periods of adjustment. And the thing is, though, they're not scared that they're going to die during this stuff, really. What they're scared right. of is that they aren't going to die during this period because these periods are filled with horrifying turmoil, mass death, and not equally distributed mass death. And the, the people who survive are changed by those, that experience. And like their conceptions of morality and, and right and identity are broken and reformed by that process. And people who have fetishize their personal ego and identity as the only real thing in the universe clutch so hardly at it that the thought of losing it is worse than death. And so they would rather fantasize that they're going to personally die. So they don't have to worry about going through that transformation than realize, Oh, like for me and my children, things are going to be different. I'm going to have to value different things. And that is so terrifying when we're addicted to the, the, the meager pleasures that we've afforded ourselves now that, yeah, we'd much rather fantasize about a cataclysmic ending than reckon with the moral responsibility of continuing. I think even more terrifying to people, more terrifying to people who are on the more comfortable side, is the idea that if you if you don't die, and yes, it's unevenly distributed, and others are dying in your place, then you have to grapple with what that means. You you have to grapple with what your life means. What does it mean that maybe in in as much as anyone deserves this when climate catastrophes happen at an increased rate compared to what they do now, you may deserve it more, but it's not going to happen to you. You have to figure out what all of the rest of your life means. That's a horrifying proposition. Yeah. And that's why all the energy is on a right wing that has an answer to that question. Turn bad into good and turn the, the, the horrors of this thing into a necessary and virtuous cleansing. And then you can continue being a, the same kind of subject you are now with the same spectacular uh, uh, view of politics that you have now and the same relative ease and comfort and never worry yourself again uh, because you will now have a world where you'll either fall off the beam and it doesn't matter, or if you stay on it, you get to cheerlead the process of, 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 of uh, transformation uh, in its worst and most like formally self-consciously evil uh, manifestation. Yes. One posture is we have to kill everyone even approaching the fence. And then the, uh, the only other posture is being 5,000 miles away from the fence and going, can you believe they're killing all of us at the fence? Yep. That's it. We all got it coming. The rest is just vanity. 
All right, gang. I think we'll wrap it up there for today. Um, any anything to plug? Any announcements for the end of the show? Uh, I would just say, uh, if you like the line of thinking that concluded this episode, I have a little podcast to recommend you. It's called Hell on Earth, and we get way into this exact <laughs> uh, discussion of you know it's always the end of the world in that show. So if you haven't listened and you like that talk, check that one out. All right, gang. Uh, till next time.